Hello everybody, in this video we're going to be covering section 4.5 where we're going to describe the fundamental aspects of titration and gravimetric analysis. And we're going to perform the stoichiometric calculations required uh, doing it during a typical titration or gravimetric uh, analysis. Uh, both of these techniques are what we call quantitative analysis. They're used to determine the amount or concentration of a substance in a sample. Starting off with titrations, this involves two solutions. So we have a little bit of language to uh, understand here. We have the titrant, the solution containing a known concentration of the reactant. So this is our known variable here, is the titrant. And then we have the analyte. This is a solution containing a reaction of unknown amount or concentration. So the thing that we don't know uh, the quantitative information about. Measuring the volume of the titrant solution, so this is what we call volumetric te technique, where we're going to be uh, making volume measurements, required for complete reaction with the analyte, uh, that the point at which complete reaction occurs is called the equivalence point of the titration, allows the calculation of the analyte concentration. Often this is done with uh, indicators, which are things that are just going to change color when a uh, complete reaction has occurred. Um, at which point, uh, when that color change happens, we call that the end point. Um, we're going to be doing this in lab, and I have made a whole separate video about titration and all the different things about it, so we're not going to get too much into this. Um, but just do realize that this is what the setup generally looks like. We're going to put an analyte down here. Uh, that's going to either be a solution or we're going to make it into a solution. And then we're going to put our titrant in the uh, burette. And that's going to allow us to really accurately figure out how much we added before we got to our uh, equivalence or endpoint. Let's look at an example problem here where we're doing an acid-base titration. So the endpoint in a titration of a 50 milliliter sample of aqueous HCl. So HCl is our analyte here, okay, because it's our sample. Our samples are always going to be our analytes. And we know that we had 50 milliliters of it. it was reached by the addition of 35.23 milliliters of 0 0.250 molar sodium hydroxide. So right off the bat, I know that sodium hydroxide is going to be my titrant. Um, and I know how much of that titrant I added, right? I know it's the titrant because I know its concentration. It's a known quantity, all right? Uh, the titration reaction is, and we need to always know the reaction that's ha happening whenever we're doing this in order to be able to perform the calculations. Uh, is this, um, and we're being asked, what is the molarity of a the HCl? So our flow chart is we're going to go from the volume of our titrant, sodium hydroxide, that we added, okay? We're going to use its molar concentration to figure out the moles of sodium hydroxide. We're going to multiply by the appropriate stoichiometric fa factor to get to the moles of HCl. And then we're going to uh, use the solution volume, how much of that sample we had, to figure out the concentration of HCl. So first, we take the volume of NaOH, our known quantity that we knew, okay, and we're going to multiply it by its concentration, all right? Now, we were told it was 0 0.250 molar, but I have written it here uh, out a little bit more clearly. We know that molar is moles per liter, so it's 0 0.250 moles for every one liter. That means to get the moles of NaOH, I need to multiply by the volume in liters. So I need this little conversion factor here to make sure that I'm in liters. Okay. When I do that all out, I see that I got 8.81 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of sodium hydroxide. Next, we're going to calculate the numbers of moles of HCl using stoichiometry. So if we go back and inspect our equation here, we can see that for every one mole of sodium hydroxide consumed, we're also going to consume one mole of HCl, so this is a pretty easy one, but do not take this step for granted. It will not always be a one-to-one -one reaction, okay? So make sure that you are performing this. Um, so we take the moles of sodium hydroxide, one mole of HCl for every one mole of sodium hydroxide, and we see that we still have 8.81 times 10 to the negative 3 moles of HCl in our sample.
Now, finally, we're going to calculate the molarity of the HCl analyte. So I need to take that moles of HCl and I need to divide it by the volume of my HCl uh, sample. Okay, we have two different volumes here, one for the sodium hydroxide, one for the HCl. So don't get those confused when you're reading these problems. And again, this needs to be in liters, so I need to include this little conversion factor right here. I do all this math out, and I see that I had 0.176 molar HCl. Okay, now I had 50 milliliters of the HCl, and it only took 35.23 milliliters of NaOH, and they're in a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, so it does make sense that this concentration of sodium hydroxide is larger than this concentration of HCl, right? In order to get an equal amount, I needed to have a little bit more HCl than I did sodium hydroxide. So there's little sanity checks if you pay attention through here to make sure that you are getting numbers that make sense. So gravimetric analysis is basically when we treat uh, some solution or uh, sample in order to change the physical state of one of the... Um, one of the reagents in there okay and that allows us to separate it uh, one of the very classic examples is going to be a precipitation reaction because then we get this solid that we can pretty easily filter out all right after that we determine the mass of the new material that we've created and separated out from a reaction mixture and that's going to allow us to determine the number of moles of that uh, substance that we produced. Let's look at a couple of examples and we can see how this is going to work out. We are also going to do a lab like this, our limiting reagents lab. Um, and so it's good to get kind of the gist of this. A 0 0.4550 gram solid mixture containing magnesium sulfate is dissolved in water. Okay, so I started off with a solid, right? Um, but I wanted to dissolve that in water and make a solution. So I now have a solution of magnesium sulfate that contained 0 0.4550 grams of the magnesium sulfate. How much water did I add? It doesn't matter. It's not going to enter into the equation or into any of the math. All right. But what is important is that we treated that solution with an excess of barium nitrate. All right. And this resulted in the precipitation of 0.4550. 6168 grams of barium sulfate. With this information, we should be able to come up with the reaction at this point that occurred. Okay, we had magnesium sulfate, we added ba barium nitrate, we produced barium sulfate. All right, if we look at what's left over, we have nitrate and we have magnesium, so we produced magnesium nitrate over here. A double displacement reaction. If we look at our solubility rules, we'll see that barium sulfate is not soluble, so it is the thing that's precipitating out as a solid. And we're going to be asked what is the concentration, mass percent, of magnesium sulfate in the mixture? Okay, so some of this mixture was some other stuff, and some of it was magnesium sulfate. So in order to solve this problem, what we're going to do is we're going to need to do a series of stoichiometric calculations like we've done so far. All right. We're going to start off with the mass of barium sulfate that we produced. We're going to figure out the moles of barium sulfate by, again, dividing by the molar mass of barium sulfate that I needed to calculate. Okay. We're going to use the stoichiometric ratio. This is a one-to-one -one that we can get from inspecting our reaction here all right and then we're going to need to multiply by the uh, molar mass of the magnesium sulfate to get the ultimately get the mass of magnesium sulfate uh, that was consumed during this reaction all right we see that that is a smaller number than what our original sample was that means that 0.313 grams of that sample was magnesium sulfate and the rest was some other ingredient. To get the percent composition, we're going to take the portion of it that was magnesium sulfate, we're going to divide it by the total mass of that sample, and we're going to multiply it by 100%. We see that 69.91% of that uh, sample was magnesium sulfate.
So uh, we've seen before elemental data um, that told us the percentage of certain elements in a, solute, in a compound. Um, one way that you can get that is through combustion analysis. Uh, and this is t typically done as a gravimetric technique, although I've also seen it done uh, using a spectroscopic technique as well. Um, and basically what we're going to do to do this is we're going to take a weighed sample of the compound. We're going to heat it to a high temperature under a stream of excess oxygen gas. Uh, and what's going to happen is it's going to burn up. It's going to yield gaseous products that we have known identities. And then what we're going to do is we're going to trap those uh, gaseous products in some sort of solid uh, substrate. And by uh, trapping it in that solid substrate, we're going to be able to see how much those solid substrates, how, hev how much heavier they got, and we can figure out the mass of those uh, gases that were produced. It's a little easier to picture it. So we have a sample here. We're streaming in oxygen. For instance, if this is a hydrocarbon, we're going to produce CO2, water, uh, and oxygen. That mixture is going to continue on. It's going to go into a tube, and only the water is going to be absorbed here. All right, The CO2 and the oxygen are going to continue on. Then we're going to have another tube here, and it's going to scrub out and absorb just the CO2. And then finally, O2 and any other gases that may have been present are going to continue on through here. All right, So now we can weigh this tube to see how much heavier it got. All right. And that's going to tell us how much uh, water was released. And then we're going to be able to weigh this tube, and it's going to tell us how much CO2 was released. Using our stoichiometry, we can figure out how much uh, carbon and hydrogen there is based on how much of the CO2 and H2O we produced, right? Remember that all the carbon is going to produce CO2, all the hydrogen is going to produce water. Let's look at an example here. Polyethylene is a hydrocarbon polymer used to produce food storage bags and many other fla flexible plastic items. A combustion analysis of 0.00126 gram sample of polyethylene yields 0.00394 grams of CO2 and 0.00161 grams of H2O. All right. We're going to be asked, what is the empirical formula of polyethylene? And basically, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a reaction that looks kind of like this. What we're And how we're going to solve this is going to be to do the exact same sort of pathway that we did when we were doing the other elemental analysis problems to, percent, to determine percent composition and stuff. We're going to start off with the mass of CO2 and H2O. We're going to convert that to the moles of CO2 and H2O. We're going to convert that to the moles of carbon and hydrogen. And from there, we can determine the molar ratio between the two and the empirical formula. If we want to go to the masses, we can determine uh, percent composition information. So let's see how that would play out. This is how much CO2 we produced. We can divide by the molar mass to figure out the moles of CO2. We know that there's one mole of carbon produced for every one mole of CO2. Therefore, there was 8.95 times 10 to the negative 5 moles of carbon in that sample. We then take the mass of H2O, divide by its uh, molar mass, use its stoichiometry, remembering that there's two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of oxygen, and determine that there was 1.79 times 10 to the negative 4 moles of hydrogen in that sample. The empirical formula for the compound is then derived by identifying the smallest whole number multiples for these amounts. Okay, uh, And we can do this division to see that there's a 2 to 1 ratio of moles of hydrogen to carbon. Um, this is just a variation on the technique that we did before where we just took these amounts and made them the subscripts and then divided by the smallest one. Uh, you Basically, we get the same sort of result doing that. And we can see that the empirical formula for polyethylene is CH2.